about children and child raising before there were children and child raising. And this one today is one I couldn't tell you how many times or when exactly I preached it, but it was before I got old. So I preached when I was what's called young about growing old or being old. And you know in all of those sermons the truth of God's word hadn't changed. The truth concerning being married was still the truth after I got married. And the truth of rearing children and the nurture and admonition of the Lord was still the truth after I had children to rear. And guess what? When it comes to being old, I didn't have to change my outline. That means then that there's nothing different about your view of those things. Well, no, uh, experiential involvement always makes a difference. It's the, how wisdom grows, if any can at all. And so today I would like to talk about uh, being old. Now I'd like for those of you who are 35 to realize that's half of 70, so 35 is middle age. Now, that's just the fact of the matter. And those folks who are in their late teens or in their 20s, <coughs> you really have no more of assurance that you'll be here tomorrow than I do. And that's the way I preached that back when I first preached these sermons in my late teens and 20s. And I always felt odd about doing that when there were folks in there at that day and time that older I am now. <laughs> but my reasoning was correct. The Bible is the Bible is the Bible, and it doesn't change on the topics it deals with. Now, you may get, of course, more insights. I, I would hate to know that you couldn't in learning how and dealing with yourself at different times in life in the application of those truths that don't change. Man is simply not construed to live always here on this earth. That would be a great deal to put into one's mind and operate accordingly. And yet most of what we do is if we're going to be on this earth indefinitely. When one grows older and nears the end of natural life, of course he's said to be growing old. Well, it's, it's strange that while most people want to live a long time, Sometimes we need to question that. Many are loath to accept the fact that to live longer means growing older. That's just the way it is. I would suggest, too, that if you're a 15-year-old, that 30-year-old looks awful old. And if you're 30, then the 50-year-old looks awful old and so on down the line. It's sort of like being wealthy. The fellow that has $500,000 at the bank looks at the fellow with a couple of million and says, well, he's rich. And the fellow with a couple of million looks at the one with five million or six million or seven million and says, he, he's, he's wealthy. And on and on you go. Truth of the matter is, everybody in this room is getting older. And the moment you stop getting older, you're not here anymore. And your body will return to the dust from which it came. We can't shut our eyes to the end of the fact that the passing of the years rob us of many treasures that we would try to keep if we could. But we can't. There was meant to be. It's interesting, though, that if you keep your right mind about you, that regardless of your age, you can always be what God requires you to be just the way it works. How are we going to define old age? How are you going to do that? I mentioned a while ago, if you're 35, you're middle age because it's half 70. It was in Job that we find that uh, man is set generally to live three score and ten. But if by reason of strength he goes longer, it's still sorrow, etc. I put a <coughs> 
cartoon on Facebook the other day with this poor decrepit soul sitting on the side of a gurney in a doctor's office looking like he's ready to fall apart. And the doctor talking to him says, here's the life you got from living all that good young life. Can't hardly get off the table. And so Paul would say it this way, um, bodily exercise profit a little, doesn't profit much. You just can't stop getting old unless you die young. How old is old? Sir William Osler, who was a noted physician, gave this definition. He said that a man is as old as his arteries. Well, we might add this to it. A man is as old as the hardening of his ideas. Folk wisdom often declares that a man is as old as he feels. And many times a person can be 20 years old and feel miserable, and the person at 70 feels quite good. It seems to me that a better definition is that age is then, and that goes along with the idea of the ideas, the thoughts, the attitude, is, is a state of mind. Someone has written that the state of mind is bounded on the north by resignation, on the east by memory, on the south by understanding, and on the west by service. These are the dominant characteristics of age at its best. Now, when it becomes abnormal, then one of these factors has become distorted. And we have a stage one gets into, we might say, well, he, he's in the class of the stand patters, or the old fogies, or the crab age, or the grouchy granddads, or the second childhoods. You say that about people when those particular states of mind, some part of them, have begun to change. Let me tell you one of the best ways to grow old is constantly going about telling yourself you're getting old. You know, your body's going to do that without you having to think about it and tell yourself that. And it starts sometimes a lot younger than what we usually call old age. Our physical powers. Well, the man who was very strong, and we've all known people like this physically, uh, begins to lose his strength. Our bodies don't serve us as well. Uh, maybe <clears throat> our eyesight is not so keen. Or maybe our, our ears aren't as skilled at hearing. Now, the long, long ago in the Old Testament, this was dealt with. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and it describes an old person and reminds young people that the days will come, and the key is, if you live long enough, to where you can say at the end of that chapter, I have no pleasure in them. That's the reason that if you'll remember the writer said to the young people, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. The writer pictures age then in symbolic language. Various places the Bible gives great emphasis to teaching good points and important points of symbolism. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble. Well, that refers in age to the sinking uh, of one's Self, if you ever had that, uh, I just don't feel up to what I used to do. And maybe literally a, a trembling of, of the hands, a shaking of the hands and arms. If you think about that day and age, so much was done physically, even more than today, and had to be, if it was done, done physically. The strong men shall bow themselves. 
Well, the legs are the strong men. And they're often give way to age. And so we get hold of something to push us up. Or if we get down, we can't get up. It's just the way it goes. And in this chapter, he refers to the grinders. That refers to your teeth. You've got to remember, we are, we're greatly benefited today because of modern uh, dentistry and things like that. But there would be a time when you grind down your teeth in those days and they wouldn't even meet. In fact, uh, the way they had to eat their stuff had a lot of grit in it. And that just ground them down faster sometimes. One of the things they found out, though, from ancient skeletons and skulls and teeth is that so many of them didn't have cavities. And there's a reason for that, and that's because they didn't have sugar like we do. Those that look out the windows, well, that has to do with the eyes. Our eyes dim, we have a problem with them. He says they'll be darkened. And the doors, that probably refers to the ears or deafness. He shall rise up at the voice of a bird. Well, think of how many older folks have trouble sleeping or getting up in the middle of the night or going to bed and sleeping well and waking up and can't go back to sleep or going to the couch to finish it off. Now, see, some of you young people may be getting older <laughs> faster than you thought you would. So who does not know about the early rising then of, of some people at different times? Um, the change of, of one's voice. Voice is getting weaker. Those of us who sing can tell things sometimes uh, with the voice that we can't do now that we could do some time ago. Then he describes the psychological reaction he talks about um, falling or high places he talks about obstructions in the way and besides the slightest difficulty the grasshopper will become a great burden and desire shall follow all of this their way in their day and time of getting over the point about growing older What about our mental powers? Well, it means the waning of abilities. That all can come at different times, and even diseases can make it worse than others. Uh, we may not be able to think as fast or recall or reason as well as we once did. We can't remember certain things, or it takes us longer to. I read a or heard a man say one time who had written a book back in his youth. He picked it up in his old age and read it and said, boy, that was a smart man back then. <laughs> the joys of work. I know there are people who won't work and don't work and they're just lazy. But a lot of us, they'd rather be busy. And it's hard when you don't have anything to do, or you can't do what you once did. It's hard to accept those things. But it's reality. And if you live the Christian life, one of the things you learned from the time you became a Christian is to face the, fact, face the facts, to face reality. It doesn't do any good to keep trying to live at 70 like you were when you were 30. Uh, you see some women who are 80 years old or 70 years old, and they're dressing like they were 16. And it does anything but enhance their beauty. Next door neighbor told me the other day, we had a limb break off and fall in the driveway. And they saw it before I did. In fact, it almost hit the woman. He came over and he said, oh, just tell your wife, Jody, that she was, she was trying out her new broom and ran into the limb. <laughs> um, that, that, that will determine how much uh, courage you have or how much you've forgotten, one or the other. Uh, 
We're robbed by growing older of our powers to dream. And this is where I want to get uh, serious. It's easy to say, well, look at my age. I haven't got much longer here. Oh, are you feeling real good? Well, I'm doing pretty well for an old man. Well, why try this? Why try that? The end's not far away. Now, that's all right to be real about that. But when it begins to make you say, well, I got my coffin already in the garage. I'm just sitting there waiting to get in it. When you meditate on things like that, you can really make old age come on faster. And that's not good. Every youth is a dreamer of dreams and a seer of visions. Uh, should be, really. Life is considered to be ahead of him. He loves ahead of him. His best dreams are yet unrealized. But in the old body, that's not so. He no longer builds air castles as he did in the youth. His best days, so far as this world is concerned, have dropped into the sunset. But should that be that way? <coughs> should he not exercise all of those years of experience and knowledge and trial and error and growth and development to be even a better service to his age than he would have been 20 years before. It's uh, also, and this is really something when it comes to older folks, when they're pretty much outlived everybody, even in their own family. So it becomes a lonely time. We can stay on this planet long enough to where we've outlived all of our lifelong associates our relatives who are no longer around. We have said goodbye to a lot of folks. So they're not around anymore. You find yourself talking about the old times, what used to be. And you don't live now and you don't live tomorrow. You live back there somewhere. Nothing wrong with good memories. The longer you live, if you live right, you're going to have good memories. But don't live in them. Now, let me pause here and say again, this is not the first time I've preached this sermon. And I've preached it far more when I was a much younger person than I have since I've got to be my age. Then, of course, the near approach of death. But the truth of the matter is, all of us are near death. The youngest in here and the oldest and everywhere in between. You have no guarantee. Well, you say, but it stands to reason at my age, I can't have many more years left. But it stands to reason that being a human being and just one heartbeat away from eternity, anybody in here may not have much longer. And guess what? I said that in this sermon when I was 20 and 25 and 30. And any sermon like this. Now at 71, I'm saying the same thing. Well, are you saying you're going to be here at 81? Don't know. But I didn't know at 20 I was going to be there at 31. <laughs> yeah, but you're older. You can't have many years left. But I've got something left if anything's left. <laughs> And so what am I going to do with them? Well, I can't do all I did my body work different. But, you know, I, have to, I, I happen to be in a situation, as most preachers, to where there's not a lot of hard physical labor laid upon me. I don't know that there's a lot of that nowadays around as much as it used to be. Used to, anybody, an adult that worked, had to do a lot of physical labor. That's not necessarily so anymore. And we all benefit from all sorts of medical blessings. A lot of folks I know would be dead right now if it wasn't for modern medicine. And if it wasn't that, they wouldn't be able to get around and do things as they once did. So we're all just one heartbeat away from eternity. The point I'm getting at, as you grow older, you physically will grow older. There will be impacts of it. The Bible recognizes it. It says you ought to recognize it. But you still keep living your life. 
you still have your aspirations and dreams and desires, let's say, for this congregation, for the Lord's cause. You may not be able to do all you once did, and things can happen to you physically that can set you back, and it will to one degree or the other. But that's all the more reason to try to help those who are still in better physical and mental condition than some of us to do better and to take our places. I think that's important to understand. So the key to all of this is the individual and how he accepts these things. Accept the fact you're growing older. Don't quit living. Act your age. Nobody wants to see somebody that's chronologically older acting like they're on their first date at 15 or 16. Be happy. If you're believing, joking, joke some. Don't sit there and say, I'm old, so I've got to be crotchety. Why? Why is that the case? I mean, Nancy knows I'm going to keep picking on her. Much to Ken's delight. <laughs> so, why? I'm afraid to do that Burnell. I'm afraid Buddy get me. <laughs> do you see the point I'm making? Sometimes it's kind of hard to put it in the words. We need then to still desire to impart something and be worthwhile to everybody we're around. I guess one of the things that keep us up and going, when I was in my first full-time work, 1969-70, Hampton, Arkansas, Population of Hampton at that time was 1,200, and the church building and the preacher's house, before married, was right off of the old courthouse square. And this had nothing to do with spreading the gospel, but it was one of those things that has to do with being a good neighbor in the community. Now, I was about 22, probably, I think I was. I was single. And the senior citizens were looking for a place to meet. And I would got in pretty good with the editor of the local paper, whose mother lived right across the road from me. When you're that age and you're single and you're by yourself, all the older folks take you in as an orphan grandchild. So do the church members. I never ate at home. I always had some supper somewhere to go eat. There's a danger to that because some of the elderly women who were considerably older than I am now would want to fix me lunch. And if one fixed me lunch two days in a row and another one didn't, that was bad news for me because they all got on the party line and really had a big discussion about why you got to cook him lunch twice. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't. <laughs> I'm serious. But we worked it around there, and I found this building probably not well, nearly as wide as this, but longer. And it was empty, just sitting there. And I was a good building. And I got with Ed to the paper, and we started a little campaign, and that became the senior citizens place to assemble. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying as you get older, get involved in something. It doesn't have to be that. Look at the stuff you can do in the church. Look at the things you can think of that have to do with edifying the brethren and helping the brethren. We, we have organized things, and that's all well and good. Everything needs to be done decently in order. But what about just individual actions? Have you ever noticed how we seemingly can't do anything unless it's in a group? Why can't you just do something yourself to keep yourself involved, to be active? So that's an important thing, that we find something to be involved in, to keep our minds active, to keep our bodies active. And surely, for those who are Christians, that ought to be the church. For those who are married, grow together. Unless you're 70 and married a 20-year-old, you're pretty much the same age. That's some thought. But uh, 
Mature love can be even finer and sweeter than youthful romantic love. You share more of life together. Your thoughts are blended in a deeper harmony and understanding. And life takes on a, a rare and, and rich beauty. So grow together. Still things to do, things to grow, things to learn. Above all, maintain your spiritual attitude, your Christian viewpoint, your Christian example. Put the emphasis where it's always been if you've been faithful all your life, and that's on spiritual values. Keep your mind fixed on the Lord as you grow older. You know, we can't always change the disposition of mind or the attitudes of our children or the conditions of the body or the unfairness of society. But we can deal with our own attitudes, our own outlook on life, beginning with our own outlook on ourselves and our fellow man, especially the church, our brothers and sisters of the Lord. Humility is still just as important as ever. So is self-sacrifice. Kindness, devotion, standing strong for the truth, defending the truth, not compromising the doctrine. They're still bearing your own burden without feeling distressed or depressed or mistreated. You see, those things can hit you at different periods of life. So they can work on you old age in a way that they might not have otherwise. We can still set a good example of being what you ought to be as you're older. You're in a position to give counsel and advice. Although a lot of young folks aren't supposed to take it. You remember the situation of Jeroboam at the time of Rehoboam came to the throne because Rehoboam would not listen to the older men. He permitted a Jeroboam to take off ten of the tribes, turn it into what it did. There's a lot that we, and this is the part I used to preach and feel pretty comfortable with this. Now as one of them, it makes you feel funny. It's what we owe the aged. You can see when you're younger and you say what we owe the aged, that doesn't involve you. <laughs> well, there's all sorts of things that we could do as far as the home is concerned. We have responsibilities to the aged who are our kinfolks. It's awful easy for younger folks to be very, well, to have a little time for the older folks. Going about their business. After all, they've got to get up and they've got to hit it. And they've got to do this, it's on and on, and this, that, and the other, and rearing children and taking care of this, that, and the other. But that doesn't take away from us uh, any of our responsibilities to other folks. There can be honor extended, Ephesians 6 2, personal respect and courtesy, Leviticus 19 and 32. There is a time in older folks' lives and personal care is offered. The infirmities of age can certainly make that so. And so on we could do. I like this little thing I found. I don't know what you call it, poem or not. That's all I know to call it. Christ at the marriage altar. Christ on the bridal journey. Christ when the new home is set up. Christ when the baby comes. Christ when the baby dies. Christ in the pinching time. Christ in the days of plenty. Christ when the wedded pair walk toward the sunset gates. Christ for time. Christ for eternity. This is the secret of home. So now I've preached this and I have been a long time at the stage that I call myself somewhat elderly. Others much younger would call me quite a bit elderly. But whatever the case may be, the Bible remains the same. And so I can at least say if this is my last sermon, I've preached this sermon <laughs> several times as I grew older to the point of preaching it while I am old. 
The truth of God's word doesn't change on what one must do to become a Christian. It doesn't change on living the Christian life. It doesn't change on marriage, the home. It doesn't change on what's right and wrong. It's the same and will be till we stand before God in judgment. And if we've lived right, there won't be any old or young or middle aged at the judgment. Because Paul says of the inward man, it's renewed day by day. It's only the outward man that perishes. And in my mind, here at 71, when I think, I think just like I thought years ago. I view things along that line. I'd like to think I know a lot more. But I look in the mirror, and that's not the young man of 20 in Hampton, Arkansas, looking back at me, or at 30, looking back at me, or at 40, and so on. But that inward man is not touched by my outward man. There are no wrinkles on the spirit. There are no gray hairs on the soul. We as Christians, above all, ought to think that way. Thus use this physical body for the tool God meant to be used as well as it can be and as well as old age will allow it. So as we close the lesson, are you a child of the living God? Are you prepared to grow old? Are you prepared to die? Because then all that age business ceases. You can become a Christian by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, Confessing your faith in Him and being baptized for the remission of your past sins. You can live for Him then and grow old faithfully, doing the work of God. However long there is in your future, you don't know. Uh, one thing I must pause here and say, over my years as a preacher, there have been a host of young people whose funerals I attended to preach. That certainly happens. And you must keep that in mind. So don't just think that, well, I've got next year and five years and 10 years and 20 years and 30 years. You have right now, and that's all you have. So if you're not ready to meet your maker right now, you need to do what he requires of you to be saved and accept his love and mercy and grace through the gospel and humble yourself and obey it. As a child of God, if you slipped, well, just don't say I've fallen down and I can't get up. Because the Bible tells you a way to get up. Repentance, confession of sins, praying God for forgiveness. So if you're subject to the good call of our Lord, then we ask you to come while we stand and sing.